Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. In 1946, the American diplomat George Kennan wrote his so-called Long Telegram, which, together with a foreign affairs article he wrote the following year, entitled The Sources of Soviet Conduct, became the basis for America's strategy of containing the Soviet Union during the Cold War. America's history is full of various speeches, papers, and books, which sometimes summarized an era, crystallizing a mood and other times proposed a policy to deal with the future, challenging a status quo. We can start with Washington's farewell address, the Monroe Doctrine, Wilson's 14 points, Roosevelt's declaration of war, Eisenhower's victory telegram, Marshall's Harvard commencement speech, Walter Lippmann's foreign policy shield of the Republic, Morgenthau's realism and politics among nations, Kennedy's inaugural address, Fukuyama's end of history, and a clean break, a new strategy for securing the realm, written by neocons which helped legitimize the invasion of Iraq. In his recent Harper's cover piece, Empire Burlesque, Daniel Bessner, an associate professor of international studies at the University of Washington and co-host of the podcast American Prestige, has written what may turn out to be the foreign policy treatise for millennials. Bessner traces the evolution of the foreign policy vision that defined the so-called American century and how it's been reshaped by failures, events, and a changing world order, including a new multipolarity and the rise of China. He draws a distinction between the liberal internationalists and the restrainers, the two dominant foreign policy camps in Washington, and he calls for planning a future beyond the American century. But can America act like a normal country? I'm happy to have Daniel on again to elaborate on his work and hopefully be challenged on it. Daniel, welcome back to the show. Uh, thanks again for having me, Rania. I'm glad to be back. Well, I mean, congratulations on your cover piece for Harper's. It's very exciting to, to be on the cover. And I mean, a lot of people, as you know, are talking about your piece, which is, you know, pretty significant. Um, so let's just get right into it. You know, you're in your cover piece. It. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. So in your in your cover piece, you argue that, as it says on the cover, the American century is over. Um, so I guess, can you explain to our audience like what you mean by that, the American century be, being over, and maybe define some of the phrases that are sort of central to that idea. One thing in particular that you focus on is the idea of armed, or armed primacy, excuse me. Oh, yeah, no, of course. Um, well, basically, uh, I just tend to look at the material sources of things. Um, and I think when you're looking at what were the material bases of, of the American century, and by which I mean really American domination of the world, American hegemony, American empire, if you're a liberal internationalist, American quote unquote leadership, or you know whatever rules-based international order, um, I think that the material bases of that hegemony are decline, are in decline. Um, so if you look at when the two big moments of, of that rise to hegemony 1945 and 1991 the united states was just the overwhelming power um you know if you look at 1945 i think it's something along the lines of the united states was responsible for 50 percent of the world exports of the world's exports and in 1991 when you take the u.s and its allies it had like 60 something percent of global gdp um and i just think that that, that material source of american power is, is just no longer um it's it's no longer extant, no longer really exists. Um, so I think that the, that the terms of American empire are going to have to change. Um, while I say that, I also want to emphasize that what's kind of unique is that the United States at the same time still maintains a world bestriding military colossus. So you have like 750 military bases. You've got the um, enormous amount spent on defense. You, you've got uh, the weapons, the drones, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a kind of a unique situation where the material sources of empire are declining at the same moment that um, – uh, at the very same moment that we have this bestriding military colossus, like the, the the literal weapons and bases. So that's basically where I am there. And you asked me to just define a term. Did I define it or should, is there another one? Well, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. If you want to like define what you mean by armed primacy, because it's been such a central sure. uh, yeah, part of American supremacy around the world. Yeah. And I mean, basically, um, I think American supremacy rests on two bases. The first one is armed primacy, this, the, the bases, the literal bases that, you know, um, that, that I think Immervar, Daniel Immervar has called like the archipelagic empire, you know, the archipelago bases, pointillist empire, right? These points around the globe. 
Um, and that that is basically just armed pharmacy. The United States is constantly threatening. You know, if, if it's funny, Americans are like these aren't threats. But if you're a, a no, it's nation, defensive, it's, Daniel. It's yeah, defensive. it's defensive. Yeah, of course. <laughs> defensive. Uh, but if you're another nation, obviously, just having these pinpricks around the world is just an inherent threat. So that's really one important source of American empire. And then the other source is, of course, dollar supremacy, dollar hegemony, right? The fact that the, the, the American dollar is a global reserve currency, which gives the United States an enormous amount of power to shape international relations. Right. And I'll, and some, I mean, there's been a lot of arguments that that is sort of starting to wane, though I don't know if I buy into that quite yet, but it is interesting to see like the euro drop in value. I mean, that just, you know, the day we're recording, I think the euro has either like reach the same value of the dollar for the first time ever. It's usually always been a bit more, um, but that's a whole different issue. But you also talk about the kind of transformational events that took place that you feel have led to what you call like the beginning of the reshaping of the U.S. place in the world. And here I'm talking about the election of Donald Trump and then the rise of China. Like, why do you think these two things in particular um, have had such an impact on the end of the American century. Sure. The more important one is China, but let me get rid of Trump at the beginning. I think Trump was important because it demonstrated to, to US allies and partners or whatever you want to call them, as well as other countries around the world, that there's not necessarily going to be the domestic American um, audience in favor of consistent global empire. Um, I don't think Trump actually changed much in practice. I think he was, you know, rel a relatively, you know, normal American leader. I mean, some renegotiations of NAFTA and the, uh, you know, the trade war with China, but you know, ultimately minor when you're talking about the structure. But it did demonstrate that this sort of hegemonic position that has basically been in question since Harry S. Truman, uh, it's beginning to be questioned more. Um, now, the, the, the issue, though, is whether that questioning matters, because as I've written about elsewhere, U.S. foreign policy is so disconnected from the democratic process that American, the American public, you know, which still right now, we have to admit, does support American hegemony, but, but might one day not. And I do think it's shifting generationally, um, whether that matters or not. So TBD, but still the election of Trump did demonstrate something new. It wasn't just Obama or Bush or Clinton or whomever, what have you. The more important thing, though, is, is the quote unquote rise of China. And rise i i mean it's obviously like a trope and a narrative trope and it, and it's popular but you know china was a very very powerful nation um had sort of a, a century of not being as powerful as it should have been given its material resources but is now you know returning to normalcy in a sense and, and, and it's reasserting itself in east asia and i think it's important because um what what happens in east asia is going to augur with what, what's going to happen elsewhere around the world um probably not as intensely elsewhere around the world and probably in a different way but the, the quote-unquote rise of china and particularly china wanting to be I, I think over the medium term hegemonic in its own region um to, uh is important because i don't think the u.s is going to be able to prevent that one the pacific is very far uh two it's unclear what vital national interests are maintained by the united states remaining hegemonic in east asia uh, i'm sure liberal internationalists will disagree about what a vital national interest is but i disagree with them and i'm right of course um but i think that it does suggest that there will be a shift in american power um in that region that is going to indicate something about broader global shifts going forward yeah. And, you know, you brought up the issue of liberal internationalists. So it's like a good segue to the fact that you frame this kind of current debate over U.S. foreign policy as being between the liberal internationalists on one side and what you call the restrainers on the other side. Can you maybe break down who these two sides are, although it's a little self-explanatory, but you maybe go into the detail. And then what is their ideology? What does it mean to be a liberal internationalist versus a restrainer? Sure. Well, I think liberal internationalism is is the default position of both sides of the political spectrum and has been since World War II. Um, to give sort of the potted history of it, it's it's a product of World War One and particularly Woodrow Wilson and even more particularly the Progressive Era, capital P, capital E, which was uh, w w within which many progressives argue that the United States would be able to manage affairs both domestically and you know internationally as well. That you would be able to view the world as a kind of chessboard where you can move around pieces uh, and that you would be able to manage international affairs and that when this was and that when this was um, uh, 
and that you'd be able to manage international affairs in a way and sort in a way in which you export American liberalism. Now that mean, meant different things to different people, but broadly speaking, that's what it is. And so neoconservatism, for example, which was like the big ideology when we were coming up, is I think just a subspecies of liberal internationalism, mm. uh, a particularly um, aggressive, unilateral focused subspecies of liberal internationalism but still a subspecies um and in fact what we call liberal international liberal internationalists is just the, the way to think about it is like the broad category is liberal internationalism and under which uh there's neoconservatism and also what we also call liberal internationalism like samantha power which is that you, you'll be able to use international institutions you'll be able to use more multilateral approaches in order to do the same thing which is make the United States, one, the, the global hegemon, and then two, uh, make other nations kind of like the United States. And that's really the default position. Now, there are different emphases, there are different tactical disagreements within these broad camps, whether you really emphasize human rights or whether you don't emphasize human rights and how much you use the military and how much you go it alone and how much you don't. Um, but those are basically the, um, the, 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 the basic propositions of liberal internationalism. Um, uh, there's also uh, this this other side of the debate that I call um, that 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 has been called. It's not my term. I think it's actually Barry Posen's term. That's called restraint, uh, and that also has a, a longstanding um, uh, history in the United States. I, it's probably quote unquote more organic to the United States, at least when you're talking outside the Western Hemisphere. Basically, everyone in American history has always said the United States should dominate the Western Hemisphere since the 1820s, um, right. but. But restraint, you know, if you go back to George Washington's farewell address, he says you should the United States should stay out of European affairs um, and that, you know, John Quincy Adams says that the United States does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Uh, and up until World War Two, there little was that they know, little did they yes, know, yes, little did they know that would not <laughs> yes. last. Uh, uh, but up until World War Two was a very powerful uh, trend. World War Two essentially uh, destroys restraint, which gets associated with pacifism or sort of racist American firsters, and it, it's really delegitimized. Um, and it, it goes into hibernation by 1949 at, at, the, at the latest and possibly earlier. But it's been reasserted amongst our generation effectively because we were uh, we, we came of age in the era of the Iraq War, the era of the Afghanistan War, the intervention in Libya, the interventions in Syria, and whatnot. And so, millennials who basically were promised in the 1990s that you know capitalism won and it'll be all kumbaya from here on out have, have been increasingly disillusioned both domestically and in terms of international affairs. And you see the resurgence of a strain, which which basically for most of the Cold War period and post Cold War period was pretty marked and pretty much confined to libertarians, you know, paleocons, and some elements of the left, like the Institute for Policy Studies, and things along that, uh, those lines, but is now becoming a more mainstream um, position. And I should actually add, uh, I, I'm also the uh, co-host of the American Prestige podcast, if people want to go uh, yes. and check this stuff out. Um, so that's basically the debate that I've aligned it. Uh, my, my problem with restraint is not so much with restraint itself, but that the fact, I, I, I think that you can't just restrain American power. You actually have to reduce it. Um, mm -hmm. But that is like really un unspeakable in Washington, D.C. right now. So I think that what I'm trying to do is promote a strategy of restraint and reduce. But, you know, in terms of official Washington, I think restraint is, is where lefties should basically align. So you also note in your piece that right now a majority of Americans, and I think you alluded to this earlier, a majority of Americans actually do side with this sort of liberal internationalists. And you, you cite this Pew poll that was taken in early 2020 that showed 91% of American adults thought that the U.S. as the world's leading power would be better for the world, which is actually, I was surprised to see this. This was up from 88% in yeah. 2018. So I, which I'm like, it's kind of counterintuitive because I always got the feeling that the U.S. public was kind of moving in the opposite direction. But of course, there is this general generational gap that you mentioned. But unfortunately, like our generation isn't, you know, in charge of public opinion. So which side is winning if that's the case? Or maybe maybe this doesn't even matter in terms of foreign policy, because the public, like you mentioned, it's very separate from the democratic process. Yeah, the public doesn't really matter. But I mean, I, I, I do think that it's it's kind of like the air Americans breathe and the water that we swim in. You know, it's just like it's been the fact for so long of American global hegemony that people don't even know how to question it, really. And I think it's more an artifact of that than any like firm commitment to American global empire. Um, but that that that's sort of it, it's almost a common sense that America should rule the world. 
And that makes it a difficult thing to change, right? Like common sense is very difficult to change. But again, you do see a generational shift. It's like one in two, you know, it's not as much as one would expect, but, you know, many more millennials are skeptical about American global leadership um, than, than boomers or Gen X or uh, the silent generation, certainly. So um, I think that's where we stand. Uh, the, the problem, though, even if we did change public opinion, it's, a, it's unclear whether that would actually result in a policy change because foreign policy is so undemocratic. It's like macroeconomic policy. It's so undemocratic. You know, it's like the, the equivalent of the Fed is, is effectively all of the think tanks in Washington, D.C. and the revolving door between the administration and these organizations. And they have no democratic accountability, extraordinarily right. little. So it's it, it's still, again, the assumption of people who actually make foreign policy that the, in, in this country, the United States, uh, that, that this nation should govern, rule the world. Yeah. And I mean, I think that speaks also to like. You, you don't mention this too much in your piece, though. I mean, your piece is obviously about foreign policy, but you don't but you don't talk so much about the American domestic politics behind that. And that's, of course, sort of like the nature of the U.S. state and capitalism itself. But you did you do know that ordinary Americans did benefit from the American empire in the three decades, specifically after World War II. But then since like the late 70s, Americans have been suffering the negative consequences of U.S. empire. Uh, you talk about militarized political culture, racism, xenophobia, police forces armed to the teeth with mili military grade weaponry, a bloated defense budget and endless wars um, without receiving much in return, save for the psychic wages of living in the imperial metropole. So I guess my question for you is, you know, do you think you can divorce the economic order inside the U.S. from its poor foreign policy? I mean, doesn't capitalism create this kind of imperialist urge to expand and seek profits and maintain hegemony. And if anything, perhaps, perhaps only socialism can actually lead to restraint. Yeah, well, I, I would say so. I mean, and, and that, that that's a classic left wing argument from like Luxembourg to Lenin, uh, that, that capitalism, that, that capitalism necessitates global expansion. Um, and they basically argued in various ways because you need to have export markets, you need to have access to raw materials. Um, so yes, I would agree. Uh, and though the problem is, is and, and some socialists might disagree with me, is that I do think that the American empire has basically set up the United States as the end in, in, in a global chain of consumption. And that Americans have been, have been consuming like a grotesque amount since World War II. And that consumption has been facilitated by... Um, by by american empire and, and you'll get people on the left who want a sort of a fully automated luxury communism i'm not quite as <laughs> right. sanguine yeah about that right I, I just think that that there might actually need to be limits on consumption um for environmental reasons and and i mean one could even say for for sort of sociality and things like that i, I mean I, I there are these old left wing critiques of consumption because one defines themselves through what they consume and that's a form of alienation not everyone agrees with that i mean i tend to to lean toward that side not not anti-consumerist but um i think a healthy skepticism of consumption is is something that I, I i believe in um and i do think consumption has been bad for the um for the environment you know and for climate and things like that if the entire world consumed like a middle-class american we'd really be cooked um so i do think we also have to refigure um our relationship to consumption on on the left um, and I don't see as much about that, but I do think it's related to foreign policy. But I also don't, I, I think that it'll be very difficult to have any form of true restraint with the capitalist system, which is just about totally expansion, uh, expansionary, totally focused on gross, to totally uh, focused on re rapacious exploitation of uh, what we today call the global south, what used to be called the developing world, and before that was called the third world and before that was called the backward <laughs> nations but basically colonial ex the entire system is based on a colonial exploitation going back to 1519 if not earlier the late 15th century so yeah that's my take on that one yeah no it's like the classic sort of like emmanuel wallerstein argument of like we can't all be denmark um and speaking right. of like the sort of like one-way relationship of trade that exists between the former colonial powers, which are still in charge, and you know the entire backwards developing world, <laughs> as its name has changed right. over time. Um, but you know, so in that sense, like it kind of speaks to the fact that, like, obviously, like you're a lefty, and you're, but you're arguing sort of like under this umbrella of a very, I think, broad ideological spectrum, right? Because when we talk about restrainers, we're not talking about a bunch of leftists. These are people 
some of them are realists, you know, some of them are just, you know, kind of your traditional progressives. Um, and then some of them, maybe very few of them, unfortunately, are actual leftists. So in that sense, I want to challenge you here a little bit. Like restraint is certainly a virtue, but do you think it's enough to start the foreign policy debate with how the U.S. projects its power or limits it abroad? I mean, like, isn't this new movement for restraint also, in a sense, kind of like a result of America's failures rather than actually questioning America's role in the global order? Absolutely. I mean, especially when you look at the realists, the realists like Mersheimer. Mersheimer um, wants uh, and, uh, the U.S. to basically leave the Middle East because he thinks it's peripheral and wants the U.S. to like really focus on fighting China, yeah. which is not something that I agree with. Right. And so I think like it, it's a loose coalition um, that that shares basically a skepticism of American power in the Middle East. That's how it started. Um, and I think uh, as America does reduce its presence in the Middle East, I do think that's going to probably happen. It's already happening and will continue to happen going forward. Um, you're going to see fissures within the restrainer camp arise, particularly over China. And there's already debates over China. Right. You actually saw a little bit over over Ukraine. I don't know if you saw like Joe. Uh, yeah. Not, uh, Joe Chirincioni. Uh, no, from, I did not. Uh, it. So he, uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Apologies if I'm getting it incorrect. Oh, I do know who you're talking about, but his name is spelled yeah. completely differently than how you just pronounced it. I had no idea if that's the pronunciation. I think it's an Italian <laughs> pronunciation. I think it's Cirincione okay. or Cirincione. Uh, but he was, uh, I think he was with Plowshares and he was at the Quincy Institute and he just resigned from the Quincy Institute effectively right. over Ukraine, right? Because the Quincy uh, approach, I think that they have been relatively heterodox, but I would say there's a skepticism of the United States being involved in Ukraine. And I think mm -hmm. that's difficult for older generations of Americans to accept because, you know, on some level, it's like they do believe the United States can make the world a better place. Right. And I just don't think that's really possible, or at, at least it's not possible without incredible evil being done elsewhere. So you right. see um, Fisher's already opening up a little bit. Um, I mean, I think the Ukraine thing is interesting because I, it really occupied everyone's attention for about five weeks. And then like once it became like more complicated, like <laughs> Americans like moved, yep, yeah, moved. They, like when was the last time you heard about Zelensky or Zelensky sex? Or whatever people were talking yeah. about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so I, it's it's kind of interesting. Like um, me, I I don't think Ukraine uh, has fundamentally reshaped in geopolitical conditions. Um, so I think like my, the structural issues are still there, but there was definitely a divide within basically the center and to the left of the center about what the United States should do there. Um, and you saw it with um, Joe Cirincione's or Cirincione's, again, apologies, uh, resigning from Quincy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, it's actually like sort of funny that that, that happened. Because actually I think, you know, most of the people at Quincy have been more skeptical than I actually would have expected in a great way. Uh, and more like, you know, really focused on the role of NATO, which I, I know cannot be easy when you're a Beltway think tank because they really yeah, it's are so like, funny. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's so funny whenever I talk to people in Washington, DC, and they're like, the Beltway's going crazy, and like no one outside of it like has talked. Like I haven't it's like uh in LA, I have not heard like one person talk about Ukraine. It's it's just funny, like <laughs> what occupies people in DC is so disconnected from what oh occupies God, people everywhere else. You know, it's, it's wild. Even it's even more like in Lebanon, in the Middle East, like oh people, God, the yeah. Europeans, the Europeans are like, why don't you care? And they're just like, dude, we're just like happy it's not happening to us. Like, right, precisely, we're just happy yeah. the war isn't here. Like, that sucks. But like, we have other things to worry about also, like the fact that and we that's can't a colonial, anything because of inflation. Right. <laughs> and that's precisely a colonial position, right? Like Americans and Europeans still view themselves as the protagonists of history. Right. Like and, and, and that comes along with a lot of assumptions about like what the United States, quote unquote, should do in the world. Like it, it's funny, like e even in colleges, <laughs> American students or people who just study here, not just Americans. So basically the global bourgeoisie are taught like to have opinions about everywhere in the world. That's not true right. in every other country. Right. You're not taught to like, what should we do or not do here? And that's <laughs> just becomes that just comes from the position of imagining oneself as a protagonist of history. And that right. Americans and Europeans, particularly Central and Western Europeans, still view themselves as being. And in some sense, they're not like totally wrong that the history of the last 500 years has been a particular world region and its offshoots shaping world affairs, though I do think that is slowly changing. 
Yeah. And you know, you you mentioned this before when you were talking about like the US's history of expansion, but of course the US has been expanding like since its creation and it, it needed to to placate its population. Like it had to give them free land, allow them to plunder all the way to the West Coast. And then of course in Latin America and around the globe. So I think it was easy for Washington in his farewell address to warn against the foreign entanglements you mentioned earlier, specifically with regard to Europe. And then for John Quincy Adams, 25 years later, to warn against interfering in the concerns of others because they hadn't like really finished their own imperial conquests in the North, in North America. And then yeah. of course, reaching the Pacific. And you do, you actually mentioned this in your piece. Yeah, I'm going to quote you because it's a good one. You say, of course, the history of U.S. foreign policy is far from one of restraint. From its beginnings, the United States expanded westwards, displaced, displacing and killing indigenous peoples and eventually seizing a number of populated colonies in the Pacific and Caribbean. So I guess like, I mean, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is, of course, like the issue of capitalism and American empire being at the root of all this. But until that is not the case anymore, can America actually just become a normal country on the world stage like Brazil or Germany or Turkey? And I mean, those aren't really normal countries, like no one's a normal country, but just a normal country like that isn't like this American empire. Can the U.S. even be that? I think it'll be tough. I mean, I, I mean, I, if I had to like guess what will happen, that that wouldn't be what will happen. I think that the United States will continue to blunder forward. Uh, capitalism will continue to destroy the world um, and, and and all that stuff will happen. So I want to just say two things. You know, if you look at the manifesto, the Communist Manifesto, Marx said something like either we'll get communism or we'll get the mutual ruin of the contending classes. I think we might be in the, the, the era of the mutual ruin of the contending classes. Uh, and then I also think when we're talking about U.S. foreign policy, I think let, let's say when it comes to East Asia. Like a wise foreign policy would facilitate a security transition so that countries that don't want to be super um, influenced by China, like, I mean, I do believe sovereignty has to be stand at the core of international relations, at least in 2022, until we have the world state. Um, you know, if Japan and South Korea don't want to <laughs> deal with China in a particular way, then there should be some facilitating security transition. I don't think that'll happen. What I think will happen is the United States will continue to blunder. The, uh, China will do something dramatic, probably with relation to Taiwan. The United States will either fight World War III over Taiwan, which I don't think will be good, or will more likely just not do anything. And then you'll have sort of chaos because no one really planned for this situation. So I think we'll just kind of blunder along because the United States is a colossus, is able, has so... Um, has so uh, insulated its population, particularly the bourgeoisie, from the effects of foreign affairs that it can afford to do that. And so like the draft, the ending of the draft in 72, 73 was, I think, one of the greatest things the American empire could have done for itself. Because mm -hmm. you could basically just insulate the population and then it doesn't matter. You know, Americans don't vote on foreign policy because they're not affected by it. Right, right. And, you know, with regard to like, I, if, if anything does, if anything does happen over Taiwan, I would honestly think it would be America that would provoke it. Because if I mean, just based on the statements you see in the war games, they're constantly playing. And the fact that I don't, it, China doesn't really seem so invested in, in aggressive maneuvers. But you know, I don't think Russia really wanted to invade Ukraine. Uh, I think if Russia is, you know, behaves in a more aggressive manner, of course, than China, than China would. But at the same time, like if you're going to corner people like repeatedly and surround them, you're kind of pushing them into a militaristic posture. So we'll see where we'll see where that goes. But is it, with respect to China, like, are we doomed to witness this return of great power rivalry where the U.S. and China are vying for, for influence or will the decline of U.S. power or the reduction of it, like you're kind of, you know, promoting, produce new forms of international collaboration, which is what we need. And this is actually a question you ask in your piece. So I'm curious what your response is to those questions that you asked. Um, in terms of whether we'll see cooperation, I don't think so. You know, I, I, mean, I, I think Jesus. that'll be very difficult for America. I'm not laughing because I'm happy. I just, that's what I do when I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> No, I, 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 no, no worries. That's sad, though. That's like if, yeah, if that's if there, it really will not be any international cooperation. We're kind of screwed. Like, yeah, I just haven't <laughs> seen it. You know, I think like, it, it's so obvious what needs to be done, and there's like no action taken to 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 do that. Like, why not actually? It, it's funny when you like read DC, uh, people in DC and sort of the liberal international think tanks, which are most of them, they get like mad that China's participating in international institutions to its like own national benefit. It's like, 
only the U.S. is allowed to do that. It's wild, you know. So when even when China is doing things like participating in Western institutions and manipulating it for its own benefit, right, which of course what any nation would do, people get upset. So when you're even thinking, looking at it from that perspective, like even within their framework. They're not happy. I just don't see anything like transformative happening. I'm very skeptical, barring some, you know, exogenous shock, which could always happen. You know, you never know. People didn't necessarily expect World War One to break out. Things like that could happen. Um, I, and they're ultimately unpredictable. But I don't see anything like that. I mean, the world didn't think Russia was going to invade Ukraine. So <laughs> things are right, right, super right. unpredictable. Um, right. You also you also write that dividing the world into good democracies and bad authoritarian regimes narrows the space for engagement with many countries not currently aligned with the U.S. And I think that you're right to say this, of course, because like this framing of democracy versus authoritarianism is so prevalent. And I would argue it's kind of also prevalent among some of the restrainer crowd. And here, the restrainer crowd, here I'm referring to like maybe some people in the Bernie Sanders camp, right, where, where you'll hear that sort of language of authoritarianism versus democracy. So are you at all concerned that this sort of emphasis on defeating authoritarianism and the way that that can so easily and already, I, I would argue, is being twisted to push for like regime change schemes against adversaries could actually be a serious problem for those arguing restraint if they're using that language? Yeah, I mean, I think I've written a lot about this. I think any Manichaean distinction of the world into good and evil is is just ridiculous and and, and facilitates really shitty policy. Um, and uh, because it's just American moralism being exported, like very like American hypocrisy and American moralism being exported to the rest of the world. Because like, I mean, the U.S. clearly doesn't actually care. Look at the various countries, Saudi Arabia, its support for apartheid <laughs> South Africa. There's like a million examples of this. So it's just so obviously hypocritical and ridiculous. Um, and I. I also don't think it, it even does what people want it to do, which is sort of like get allies into line, you know? So I think it's just a totally ridiculous approach to the world affairs that needs to be abandoned yesterday. And um, that's, I mean, that's, I've written a lot about it. That, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, you actually <laughs> didn't know you did. I think, yeah. I think like during, during the Bernie Sanders camp last campaign, you actually, was it you yeah. who wrote, I think it was in the nation. You specifically yeah. like yeah. covered that issue. Cause he, during a debate was like authoritarianism. And it's like, dude, yeah, he did a speech. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, and, and, and that's, Oh, it was a speech. Like, yeah. It was his foreign policy yeah. speech. Sorry. Go ahead. It was, it was his big foreign policy speech, which I think just reflects the era that Bernie grew up in, you know, where this was just the water that people, again, the water that people swim in and an assumption about geopolitics. And like, yeah, it, it, it works when you're talking about Nazi Germany, you know, one of the most <laughs> grotesque regimes imaginable in, in world history. Um, but it doesn't work when applied to you know to most other regimes. I mean, it's, it's usually not the 1930s, and most leaders aren't Adolf Hitler, uh, who was right. like a particularly awful you know, one of the most grotesque figures to be produced by humanity. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, and I think the framework imported from the 1930s, which is really when that framework arose, um, is just not especially helpful for dealing with the problems of 2022, particularly when we have like such global problems like climate and pandemics and inequality and, and the sort of um, the, the, the shifts that all of, all of those processes will engender. It's just not a helpful way to think about IR. And, you know, I think like we were kind of talking about this earlier, but the left seems to have or the left has, I think, zero power over foreign policy. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, restrainers are not necessarily leftists, though a couple might be, yourself included. But why do you think it is that the left is so weak? Uh, oh, I guess the left has no power over anything, sadly. But in this particular case, I guess my real question is, how do we get control of the blob? <laughs> That's right. I mean, question. Can good we? question. And I, I, I have an answer. I have a question for you after this. Um, yeah. But like, I mean, the, the U.S. government has been like consciously destroying the left since 1910, you know, uh, and, and before that. So it's not a surprise that the left isn't really powerful in this country. It's a it's a right wing country and has been for the entirety of, of the modern era. Um, and there are various movements from like the Red Scare to the arrest of Deb. I mean, the arrest of Debs first, then the Red Scare and the anti-communism and you know american labor unions which have always been more right wing than labor unions in other countries aligning with the american state at various points um that that explain the left's uh the left's weakness but like i i mean i wouldn't even say the left has a foreign policy that's when i want to ask you what do you think the left's foreign policy even is it's <laughs> like super point. incoherent yeah 
Yeah. It's like, I mean, like, and who is the left? Is it DSA, which is has incoherent policies? Is it random thinkers like me, which is are going to disagree with other thinkers? You know, and this is the problem with no disciplining organization to mm-hmm. like, I, it's like when people talk about left wing internationalism, I'm like, what are you talking about? There is like, there is no left wing international because there's no disciplining organization able to actually coordinate and discipline, you know, and barring that, then you're just talking about random instantiations of relationships, which like maybe good in particular instances, maybe, you know, a US organization could ally with a Mexican organization and achieve something, but that's not left-wing internationalism in the sense that anyone who was talking about it in the 19th or early 20th centuries meant it, which was like actually coordinating and disciplining power across borders. We just don't have that. This is why I ultimately think that um, and, and so, like, I think, like, leftists are, are, are by, by inclination internationalists. But I think that we have to accept the reality that we're living in a world of nation states, and that's not exactly about to change, so that we have to think about nation state-based left-wing organizations. That's just the reality of the situation. And then maybe over time, we'll be able to build those sorts of bonds across borders. But I often find a, a sort of romantic naivete on the, the left when they're thinking about power, which is, like, yeah. a, 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 a sort of, like, a, a vague reference to internationalism that, again, does not exist empirically. Sorry, but it just doesn't. Yeah, there was, I mean, there was this like big, you know, controversial debate in dissent. We don't have to get into that, but there was a lot of talk about what I haven't actually, I have to admit, I haven't actually like read the pieces yet. Um, but no, I mean, I think that's a good point. I don't have the answer to that. Like, I just, you know, I kind of operate from a framework of like anti imperialism. And being, you know, the sort of like Chomsky view of like, you know, you have to just like deal with your country's own foreign policy. But that's speaking from a position of weakness because you're constantly having to antagonize against a foreign policy that you actually have no control over. So I think you're absolutely Right. right. There is no like sort of centralized political organization. There are a few different ones. And even those ones are quite chaotic and not well organized and incoherent. And I think, you know, that again, like I, you know, it's easy it's easy to trash the American left or the left in like Western countries. But like you said, I mean, there has been a very long concerted campaign, a vicious and violent one. In fact, that, you know, against there's a reason the left is so weak in America. Yeah, they've been destroyed. We've been destroyed. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, like and consciously even now, by the American state. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and even now, I mean, like, you know, I think one of my really, really good friends here in Lebanon uh, will say that like to be an American leftist is almost like you have to almost kind of be a little crazy because you gain nothing from it. Like you, you only, it's like you only get attacked and you only right. make sure like you only limit your ability to get work. <laughs> like it's like, there's right. so, there's no benefit to it. It's quite the opposite. So it's like, it's, you know, it's even, and you know, it's even, I think like more different, that's just to be a leftist domestically, like not to even speak about speak you know the being a leftist on foreign policy so yeah there's a lot of issues connected to that that i think we could probably spend hours discussing so i won't do that but you know you did mention this and i'd like for you to maybe elaborate a little bit why do you think it is that international cooperation versus this great power competition this debate in particular is so important today than perhaps arguably at any time in history like it does seem like we really are at this kind of fork in the road and it like raises the question of what kind of future we're looking at. Like what kind of future do you foresee if the liberal internationalists win versus if the restrainers were to win? What would this Yeah, two I think it's a good question. Like? Well, I think this is a moment of actual like the the, the basic the material bases of American power are attenuating. So I think like this is a moment to do it. Um, although again, I think like it's very it's almost certainly just going to be the liberal internationalists winning. So I think again, the liberal internationalists are going to probably win. They're just going to keep on stumbling forward. You know, I don't I don't I don't see any political leader who, who would be able to really do that. Maybe if Bernie won and he had, you know, uh, from day one really focused on using a lot of political capital to really re-examine the basis of imperial power, that could have changed. But um, barring that, I, I, I don't see, you know, like maybe if Ilhan Omar or, or Rashida Tlaib were, were somehow elected president, you, you'd see something uh, <laughs> along those lines. But it, I, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. Um, so I think you're just going to get continued blundering, continual, continued um, American abuse of its power abroad. If the restrainers won, I think you would see a reduction in, in, in damage in particular world areas uh, like the Middle East. Um, most first and foremost, but you might also see, you know, uh, the United States 
leaving or, or weakening its hold on NATO, which would probably be a good thing. Um, but even with restraint, again, there's a lot of people within that camp who believe the United States should confront China. There's a lot of people within that camp who believe the United States shouldn't confront China, and you would have to see uh, which way that would shake out. So uh, TBD on that. But uh, again, I, 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 I don't see uh, liberal internationalists losing anytime soon. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I will say like the U.S., I think there has certainly been a reduction of U.S. interference in the Middle East. And I mean, I, I'm not saying the U.S. is not involved. Obviously, the U.S. still has many bases is. in the Middle yeah. East. Yeah, very much, you know, still spending billions on Israel, billions on Saudi Arabia, um, obviously still provocations with Iran. All these things are still happening. And I want to make sure I know, like, as, especially if like there's a war with Iran tomorrow, I'll cut this part out. Um, no, but, <laughs> but no, but there has been, I think, and, uh, you know, being here, I can see how, how clear it is. There's been a reduction in the U.S. presence in the region. And as a result of that reduction, actually countries have been forced to deal with each other in ways they otherwise right. wouldn't have. Like you have seen a sort of like, uh, less tensions between the Saudis and the Iranians. The UAE and Iran are like kind of, you know, frenemies now. Um, and, you know, you have in Yemen, there's, you know, I know Joe Biden took like responsibility stupidly for this like truce in Yemen, but he actually has nothing to do with it. Uh, that's more because these countries have been forced to like deal with each other. Um, and when the US isn't involved, I think sometimes there's less likely to be tensions than when the U.S. is involved, because when you have the U.S. backing you, if you're Saudi Arabia, you feel like more encouraged to Absolutely. like go all the way. But that that said, you know, I know what your answer to this is going to be, given everything else you said, but maybe I'll be wrong. Is it possible to dismantle the American empire? And if it was possible, how would you begin? Like, would it be like base by base from like Okinawa to like Udaid <laughs> to Ramsey? Like, where, how would you even start? I mean... I can't even imagine that world, but if we had to imagine it. <laughs> well, it's certainly possible. Um, I mean, anything is possible. But I, I think that uh, the way you would actually have to start would be with the domestic, the, the domestic, and you'd have to start with actually doing social welfare for, for uh, congressional communities that rely on military bases. So you'd have to basically start with reducing Congress members' reliance on the pork from military bases and go from there. Because once you actually start attenuating it at home, then I think it's pretty easy to do abroad. Um, that's one way to approach, or I guess you could just start abroad, you know, closing bases that are obviously tangential to U.S. security and then go from there. But I do think it would be important to basically undercut Congress's support for the empire, um, because so much of the, I mean, all of the money, of, uh, theoretically at least, comes from Congress uh, in terms of discretionary spending. And I think that would be a good way to, to undercut it. Um, and that you might start seeing a little bit of that, but I think it would have to come along with speaking about socialism, it would have to come along with the social democratic um, transformation in the domestic political economy. And, and, you know, the thing about this country is we only get social democracy when it's attached to the military. We get right. military Keynesianism, right? When you're looking at whether it's building housing in, in World War II for war workers at factories, um, whether it's, it, it's, it's literally the military getting socialist benefits even though they're not always great like you look at the va but you know you you do get socialist-esque benefits within the military we've always had it attached to militarism so i think maybe trying to get that cut that line between militarism and social democracy in this country would also be a good way to approach it yeah no i think that's a good point especially because of the fact that like everything economically in america is like undergirded by the military industrial complex in so many ways. And to right. that end, you know, I had Anatole Levin of the Quincy Institute. I had him on a couple months ago to discuss the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I actually asked him about the think tank industry. And he spoke of his American think tank colleagues and how everything they said and did, and this is like an exact quote, is tailored to calculating whether this would help or harm their chances of becoming chief assistant to the deputy chief assistant dog washer which I thought was very funny. Um, right. I mean, absolutely right. I mean, there's these, these, these professional incentives, right. That like I, I bar barring like a Bernie winning, I, like I would never be invited into an administration. So, I mean, I, I don't care, but some people do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. But like much of your work has actually looked at the defense intellectuals and at think tanks. Um, and it's, it is like this vast extension of the government with like these like thousands of dogs, like barking for more war with only a few exceptions. So, I mean, briefly, I guess, how did this industry evolve? 
And why is it so pro-imperialism and pro-intervention? Sure. Well, I mean, involved in tandem with the American empire, uh, you see antecedents like the, the quote unquote inquiry that helped Woodrow Wilson prepare for the, um, the, the Versailles conference. Uh, you get the, um, you, uh, sorry, the Paris peace conference. You get the, you know, Brookings created in 1916, the council on foreign relations created out of the inquiry. in I think 1921, but it really comes to fruition in the 1940s when, uh, as world war II was closing down, you have, Business, businessmen, they were pretty much all men, uh, policymakers and intellectuals worried that the brain power that had migrated to Washington during the war would kind of go back to the university. And so you get the creation of, of Project RAND, which merges, which, which morphs into the RAND Corporation by 1948, which is really the first national security think tank. And it builds itself as this nonpartisan place for eggheads to come and make U.S. foreign policy better. And it's funded by the Air Force. Uh, but it's nominally, quote unquote, private. So it's like free of democratic accountability. Uh, and then from RAND, you get the prolifer proliferation of institutions um, within American academia. You get like Harvard Center for International Affairs, places like that. But also you get more think tanks like the Hudson Institute, the Center for Strategic and International Studies over the course of the 50s and 60s. And then in the 70s, you get kind of the, the partisan version of that with the Heritage Foundation followed in the 90s by the liberal version of that with like the Center for American Progress, which I think is founded in the 90s. Let me just double check 2000, oh, 2003. So 90s and 2000s, um, and maybe the newer, whatever. Uh, and so you get this basically techno structure of institutions that are nominally private, but effectively rely on the government for both um, access. Um, so therefore, they rely on the government to make sure that they influence and oftentimes money as well, not only the US government, but other governments as well. And so this has basically been a 70 year trend of a particular um, techno institutional structure that is very influential in Washington, D.C. And actually, it's kind of small. So you could maybe do a Leninist cadre strategy where like left wing intellectuals would would infiltrate and shape these institutions. I mean, you'd have to have these institutions somehow accept left-wing intellectuals in some way. So I'm not sure how exactly that's going to happen, but it's small enough where a cadre-based strategy might work, but that's effectively where defense intellectuals reside and continue to shape U.S. foreign policy. And then in parallel to that, like, why do you think the media establishment is so dominated by the same mindset? Uh, because that's how you rise within it, right? You, you know, you're not going to make money challenging Americans' perceptions of themselves. Damn. Right? Yeah, I Damn. know. I, know. For us. I wish that, I, I mean, had it's known. It. <laughs> you know, like the, the consent has been manufactured. And so, like, <laughs> you're going to have to basically flatter that if you want to make a career in these institutions. Of course. Of course. And then, you know, I, you, you back to like just real quick on the issue of China, you said of the liberal internationalists in your piece that and this that they they hope to combat China without discrediting liberalism writ large. Can you elaborate on, on what you mean by that? Well, it's particularly because of China and the United States are so intertwined economically and, and liberal, like the, the presumption of liberal democratic capitalism is that you'll have free exchange of goods and services and some for some people, people. Uh, for some others, not, but, you know, basically at least you're trading goods. And so the United States and China are so economically implicated that you have to basically walk the line of quote unquote challenging Chinese military hegemony and economic hegemony or the, 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 the search for that in East Asia while also maintaining trade relations. So that's kind of a difficult thing to do. And I think that that's the problem that liberal internationalists are really confronting right now, right? How do you frame this Manichaean fight between democracy and authoritarianism while still saying we're trading with China, which we need to, at least as the global political economy and American political economy is currently structured. Yeah, and I think you might even be running into something similar when it comes to the issue of sanctions on Russia, uh, right. because I think that that's proven, at least for the short term, to it's proven that Russia actually is like this commodities powerhouse that at least Europe and so many other countries around the world, maybe not entirely, maybe not necessarily the US, but so many other countries are actually quite dependent on and it's not so easy to just cut ties when you need their right. gas. Right, and I, I, exactly. Or grain, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think you're going to see changes in U.S. policy toward Russia for precisely that reason. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's also interesting, too, because, you know, I'm curious if you think the U.S. is maybe in a weaker position today than it was during the first Cold War, because I think we're kind of like in a second one now. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, 
it just looking around the world, so many of America's allies in the global South have refused to join in the U.S. side against Russia, like India, right? Brazil. And I mean, that's largely because they need Russia for the reasons I just mentioned, like they need Russian gas. They buy weapons from Russia. Russia is an important big country that produces a lot of raw goods that countries need. And, you know, if I'm Brazil or I'm India, yes, I want, you know, I'm best friends with the US, but like, I'm not going to like cut off my, you know, cut out, like cut out one of my internal organs to make the US right. happy when I get nothing for it. So I'm just curious, like, based on the fact that, you know, so many countries around the world are like refusing to take a side, do you think that says something about waning American power? Well, I, I think it suggests that the structures of the U.S.-China confrontation are just different than the U.S.-Soviet one because the U.S. and Soviet real Soviet Union really had very little economic interaction. You know, that's just very different from the U.S. and China. And so, you, what, what happened in the '90s and 2000s was sort of this moment ever of globalization. You had you had the the embed, embedding of various world regions into into the global political economy. So you you can't. Like during during the Cold War, you could just say, okay, you're not going to trade with the Soviet Union, and that's not that hard because you never really traded with them, and you get everything from the United States. You can't really do that anymore because the, the structure of the global political economy is just totally different. So what you have is you have a, 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 a you know a new Cold War rhetorically without the actual structure and conditions of a Cold War like existed between the United States and Soviet Union. So that's a, that's a unique situation. Um, and so I think that that's something that U.S. policymakers are going to, I mean, they probably won't, but in theory they should deal with that tension, but they're probably not going to. They're probably just going to keep on lambasting China or Russia while actually trading with China. <laughs> and they have no probably choice. in a few months, Russia, yeah, there's just no choice. Right? And that suggests in some sense that the algorithm is conscious or the system is running itself and that policymakers ha have actually limited ability to affect grand changes in the global political economy in 2022, which wasn't necessarily true in 1955. Yeah, it really is interesting to see like they're basically this war dragging it on, pouring weapons into Ukraine, which basically guarantees it will continue. Um, right. And, can, and, you know, like continuing to enforce these sanctions and kind of like pushing other countries to abide by them uh, is creating a pretty dramatic and urgent situation in the global south, especially like people are they, and the and U.S. officials are saying this like openly, like mainstream media is quoting them as saying like, OK, like, yeah, I mean, hunger is going to rise. Starvation is going to happen. But like we have to confront Russia. And it just seems like unlike maybe during the cold war aside from the fact that like people were risking like nuclear war and that was pretty serious it almost seems like they're they're going to bring about their own demise by right. pursuing these policies like i it just it, it's ironic and also like don't you see that like i'm not i'm not one to try to advise imperialists on how to do it better but I mean, come I mean, on, guys. <laughs> look what happened with World War One. I. I mean, the European aristocracy committed suicide. Um, so it's happened before, right? That was the end. 1789 to 1914 was like the last gasp of the aristocracy, and then they ended it all in World War One. So things like that have happened before, uh, particularly when you have gerontocratic leadership, which we do in the United States right now. You know, like it's <laughs> wild how old our leaders are, um, living yeah. in a totally different world than the one that actually exists today. So I'm not, I'm not especially hopeful. Yeah. And then, you know, America was in this kind of like, I think, imperialist malaise after Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and then, of course, the shame of having a president like Trump. Do you think the Russian war in Ukraine has brought back America's like imperialist groove or mojo? I don't think so. I think people wanted it to because Americans like having romantic attachments to causes that they view as noble. Um, but yeah. I just don't think it's just not as geopolitically an important an event. This is not to deny like the horrible suffering that Ukrainians have. Or, or I, I mean, I do think the responsibility for the war is Putin's. Um, but I, 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 uh, I just also think that the, the, it doesn't really affect the, the great structures of geopolitics. I mean, you could see it, there's Americans have already lost interest in it. And it hasn't been going yeah. on for that long. You know, there's just no talk about it. You, when you see the Ukraine flags coming down, you know, that, that were in people's bios or, or in their houses because it wasn't yeah. what they wanted it to be.
Yeah, Americans have short attention spans. And also, like, I think that people were telling themselves fairy tales about how it was going to be so easy to, like, win this war <laughs> right. against Russia. Like, and also, I think that, that so many horrible things have been happening in the U.S. that it's just at some point, you Ukraine couldn't be the headline forever because, like, every month we have just a mass shooting that's, you right. know, more horrifying than the last, which speaks to, like, the internal decay I think that's taking place in the U.S. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and I guess you know, as like a last question, I want to ask you: What do you think future historians will attribute America's the end of the American century to? Like, what will they point to in a hundred years and say, "Oh, like that's when it started," or like this was the most crucial event, or like these series of events were the most crucial events that led to this? I, personally, I think the project was doomed from the beginning. I mean, it's steeped in this progressive ever notion that you can manage things that are ultimately unmanageable. So I think like the the, the philosophy of it is wrong. Um, but even going from the philosophy, like uh, the I mean, the hubris and naivete of believing that one could reshape the world in the in the country's image, you know, whether you're talking about overthrowing leaders in Iran and Guatemala, uh, whether you're talking about fighting the Vietnam War or invading Iraq, it, it's all hubris and naivete about the the ability of the United States to remake the world, uh, and it's fundamentally fraud in its ontology, almost that 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 the dream, the liberal dream, the progressive era dream, is just a fantasy, and it turned out to be a nightmare. It was all a matter of time, <laughs> is what you're saying. All a matter of time. Yeah, it was doomed from the beginning. <laughs> I think. Well, on, on that note, Daniel Bessner, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Of course, everybody go check about uh, check out American Prestige, excellent podcast that you co-host. Is there anything else you want to plug before uh, we end Just here? the Harper's piece, uh, American Prestige, sign up for ideally the paid one, but also the free newsletter <laughs> uh, and uh, read the Harper's piece. And uh, Rania, thanks so much for having me on. I, I love your podcast and I love your work. Well, thank you so much. The feeling is mutual and I hope to have you on again soon. Happy to do it.